we thank the management for giving us the opportunity to host this call. Uh, today, uh, we have with us uh, Dr. Satyana Rayanathawa, founder and CEO, Mr. V. V. Ravi Kumar, Executive Director and CFO, and Mr. Vivek Kumar uh, from the Investor Relations team. I would like to hand the call over to Dr. Satya for his opening comments. Thank you and over to you, sir. Thank you for uh, joining us for our Q4 and fully year FA22 results conference call. I hope and wish everyone and their family members, colleagues and friends are keeping safe and healthy during these challenging times. We are pleased to have this opportunity to update you on our progress and answer your uh, questions. During the last quarter, the industry faced some interim turbulence on the raw materials front and also availability and cost of solvents. Now with the recent geopolitical conflicts and re-emergence of COVID cases in China and elsewhere are posing new challenges. The disruptions in the supply chain and logistics has further increased. We are trying to minimize any disruption to our commitments to customers by expanding our critical supplier base. We are also tracking all of this and would stay as I and force course correction uh, as we execute our commitments. The overall FA22 operationally has been fairly resilient, where we have stabilized on our sales, and profitability was maintained closer to 30%, despite headwinds in our AR VIP business. We also believe that it was an important year where we witnessed, invested significantly in capacity creation, strengthen our R&D capabilities, built new partnerships in CDMO, and steadily delivered on diversification of revenues along with minimal supply chain impact. This was despite a lot of uncertainty and disruption in the business environment. During the year, we also successfully forayed into disruptive car T technology by way of investing in Immuno Act for a substantial minority stake. This investment should significantly help in bringing innovative and more affordable medicines in this region. We continue to fortify our core to bring more resilience in our business operations to deliver long-term sustainable growth and enhance strategic customer value proposition in the coming years. We remain effervative on our aspirational sales target of a billion in FA23, and this will be supported by several approvals anticipated and good progress we made in our multi-site capacity expansion across all divisions, including CDM. Moving on to our financial results for full year of 22 we achieved 4,936 crores um, with a growth of 3%, whereas Q4 we achieved 1,425 crores against 1,412 crores in the corresponding quarter. Sequentially, uh, we have substantially improved on our revenue numbers across major business verticals as guided in our Q3 call. To begin, I would like to share key updates on our uh, formulation business. The formulation division reported revenues of 1880 crores in FA22 with 13% growth, whereas 491 crores for the quarter with an increase of 14%. The contribution from this division has improved during FA22 to 38% when compared to 35% in the previous financial year. Coming to LMIC Yaru business, we started witnessing gradual stabilization in the demand from various uh, multilateral agencies versus uh, our previous quarter performance, which was impacted due to stocking at various channels. Dual degree based regimen continues to remain preferred antiretroviral treatment, and believe its use will also increase rapidly in second line as well as pediatric treatments as a new standard of care. During quarter four, we received final approval for low penetral retinal combination from the US FDA, and we have launched that product in recently. Additionally, we are awaiting a few more product approvals, uh, which should drive growth in the coming quarters. Laris is fully integrated player in ARV formulations, and we do believe 
we have fair ability to weather any pricing challenges in the coming quarters. Happy to share that Laras has signed and will be part of MPP license for Pfizer's oral COVID drug Paxlovid. This will increase the broad access in LMIC markets. Coming to the developed markets, we are observing stable market share for our products. We are not seeing any pricing pressure here. We continue to leverage our front-end presence in the U.S. market for the new product launches. We have filed one product during the quarter, and a total of four handouts were filed during FA22. Our overall filing number has improved versus FA21, and we expect filing pace to pick up during the current financial year. We have received three approvals during the quarter, and total five approvals in FA22. Cumulatively, we have a total of 31 and as five. Um, out of these, we have a total of 11 final approvals and 11 tentative approvals so far. In Canada, we have 11 products approvals, um, of which we have launched five products, and we intend to launch two more products in the next few quarters. For the European markets, we have validated two products as part of our contract manufacturing partnership. We expect a significant upside in FI23 from this product. In Europe, we have a basket of eight approved products, of which we have already launched three products, and we will be launching more products uh, based on the market opportunity. Based on our healthy product pipeline progress, we continue to invest in FDF infrastructure. Our brownfield expansion at Unit 2 is progressing as per our expectations and is expected to add significant capacity to our FDF operations, taking the capacity to 10 billion units. Currently, the brownfield expansion is on qualification and will be ready for commercial use before June 22. On the R&D front, we continue to allocate critical resources and invest in portfolio with product-specific approach, not the market-specific approach, based on the complexity and scale economies. Additionally, we are implementing steps to bring more robustness in our overall product development processes. Besides this, we are happy to share that we should be ready to commercialize our uh, sterile R&D unit uh, during this quarter. Uh, this is being set up at uh, ICS in Alt Park Shamit Bay. Overall R&D spending to sales for this quarter and full year was at 4% of our revenues. We have a total of 62 products in the R&D pipeline, um, either under uh, development or under uh, validation, with an addressable market size of 45 billion brand sales. I would like to share the status of our filings. 31 handouts in US, 11 those years filed in Europe, 17 in Canada, 9 with WHO, 4 those years in South Africa, and 7 in India, apart from 19 products filed in various ROW markets. Of the 30, 31 handouts filed in US, we have 15 para 4 filings and 10 first to file opportunities, having a sizable market opportunity. As mentioned, our approach remains product specific, not market specific. During the quarter, we have successfully completed EMA inspections for our unit 2, and brown pool expansion also was inspected by the European agency. When we move to give you updates on the generic API, we want to update you on the antiviral uh, ARV front. ARV period during the quarter saw improvement in uh, procurement and uh, sales to other uh, generic companies have grown sequentially uh, by 47% to almost 300 crores. For the full year FA22, the business reported negative growth of one third, almost 33%, due to high base effect. While overall demand environment stays softer, we remain optimistic about uh, further recovery in the coming quarters. We continue to maintain a leading market share in the product line, what we sell, and also expect to increase our developed market API supply. We are also happy to share that Anko APS reported 72 core sales during the quarter, reflecting a growth of 16%. Uh, Laris Labs have one of the largest high potent API capacities in India, and we are 
partly adding new capacities during the uh, next 12 months. We also had a lot of capacity in the previous 12 months as well. Our aim is to strengthen global leadership in some of the existing products by focusing on uh, high potent molecules uh, and increase our market share. In other APIs, other than ARBs and ANCO, uh, we have achieved 171 crore sales during the quarter. This was supported by new contractor supplies. For FY22, while our growth was muted, we believe the segment should return to healthy growth trajectory in FY23. During the quarter four, we have filed two DMFs, both non ARB taking the total number of BMFs filed to 73 to date, and we filed 12 BMFs in FA22, which is maximum BMFs filed during a financial year in the company's history. We also initiated validation of few API and expect to see good growth in FA23 and 24. We continue to have higher order book visibility in the segment, and accordingly, we're adding manufacturing capacities to capture this opportunity. When it comes to CDMO business, this business has maintained its solid growth momentum and delivered robust growth, and we doubled our revenues from uh, uh, by almost 100 percent to 360 crores in the Q4. For FA22, CDMO business grew very strong over 75 percent year and year. We continue to pursue several active projects in the late stage clinical programs and commercial supplies ongoing for both products. On our multi-year supply contract, we executed in a quarter two FA22. The capex work is on fast track. Yeah. Additionally, our proposed greenfield investment to set up a dedicated R&D center for our CDMO division at the Genome Valley Hyderabad and three manufacturing units in Vizag under lot of synthesis is progressing as per our expectations. New sites for this division will have the capabilities to handle steroids, hormones, high potent molecules, apart from large-scale uh, products. The last one, uh, the revenues have improved over 40% quarter on quarter to 35 crores, mainly led by new capacities getting operational. Uh, for the full year, FY22, the sales was 100 crores, uh, which is a very significant growth, um, almost 70% compared to pre-acquisition annualized run rate of 58 crores as you bought uh, more operational synergies and added more capacities uh, to this division. We are also gradually ramping up on the 180,000 liter fermentation capacity uh, with our large scale partners. We scheduled expansion at R1, including new R&D block, and installing balancing equipment to enhance capacity at R2. This expansion will be completed before September 2022. We are also in the process of acquiring additional land to further expand our manufacturing capabilities to offer CMO services for uh, recombinant food proteins. Our focus on ESG, quality, and regulatory compliance to drive sustainable growth and further accelerate on efficiency and pipeline opportunity remains our top priority. This will aid our journey towards our vision and strengthen our core values. With that, I would like to hand it over to Ravi to share financial highlights. Thank you, Dr. Satya. And very warm welcome to everyone on our quarter four and uh, full year FI22 earning call. Uh, the total income from operations uh, 4,936 crores uh, as against uh, with a 3% uh, uh, growth. And uh, the quarter is about 1425 crores against 1412 crores uh, reporting in uh, a similar number uh, for the both uh, corresponding quarters. But of course, the sequentially we have grown uh, as we indicated in the quarter three. Uh, gross margin imp improved to full year at uh, around 56%. But of course, the quarter four, uh, the gross margin is slightly lower side. Uh, that's because of the solvent price increase uh, substantially in the, uh, in the quarter three that is what affected or consumed in quarter four. And uh, there is a selling price uh, decrease from the uh, ARV supplies, and of course, the product mix also will matter. Um, our EBITDA is uh, for the quarter four at 398 crores, uh, it's around 28% margin. For the full year, uh, uh, 1436 crores uh, with 
99 percent uh, uh, we have indicated that 30 percent is our uh, expected gross margin it is close to what we have guided our diluted eps uh, for the quarter is at 4.3 and uh, 15.4 for the full year basis our row c is at uh, 26.3 uh, and capex spread to for a cash flow we have done about a 950 crore capex in the full year uh, this is well within the two year guidance uh, rest of the capex will be incurred in the uh, this current fiscal fy23 fiscal we also want like to update that most of the investment across key projects on track and of course we need we have provided more details in our uh, investor presentation we can uh, refer to that we remain uh, on course to strengthen our position as a cost effective integrated former player and we are investing in backward integration efforts and in making intermediates creating further ap and fdf capacities in the non arv infrastructure of course you all aware that we are in a most difficult challenging times uh, not only on the war side but also from the covid covid front in the china side we are uh, trying to gear up by using all the techniques to not to have any production losses. With this, I would request the moderator to open the lines for QA. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. We will now begin the question and answer session. Anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and one on your touchstone telephone. If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star and two. Participants are requested to use handsets while asking a question. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. The first question is from the lineup to Sharmanu Dane from Motila Loswal Financial Services. Please go ahead. Thanks for the opportunity. Uh, so just on these uh, selling prices of ARV, if you could just uh, throw some light in terms of how much, uh, on, a, on a relative basis over past six months, how much the prices have fallen and what has triggered this price fall? The FY22 ARV sales for most companies who are in the and ARV space were significantly lower, and everybody has significant inventory. That led to the price decrease both in APIs as well as in the formulations. I can't give you a specific number, uh, but uh, the API prices and ARV prices both were down, um, I would say, Around 10 percent, I would say. Well, I can't give you a specific number, but around 10 percent. Sure, sure, that helps. That helps. But, but with this inventory now getting normalizing, there's no, or rather, limited scope of these prices recovering. So, whatever 10 percent falls, that is how it will probably uh, continue in the uh, going forward basis as well. I see some improvement will come from um, softening of the raw metal prices and solvent prices. But I would not foresee the API prices and the formula prices going up. I, I think this could be the new pace. So we haven't seen any significant price drops from FI 2021 20, remain constant. FI 22 was the year where we saw a drop. But I don't think FI 23 will have a further drop. I think this is the going to be the new pace. And we don't see... We, we have seen from Q3 to Q4 and also Q1, we have order books, and uh, the prices are at a new base right now. Uh, we don't expect uh, prices will go down further. Got it. And just on your uh, 1 billion target for FI23, so broadly, will it be like spread out across four quarters, or you see more in second half FI23 if you throw some color on it? Uh, I think it has to be spread out. I can't give you, I can't give you a very specific number, but it will be evenly spread out. Yeah. Understood. And just lastly, uh, with this F one billion in FI twenty three, like how much of it, you know, could uh, you know uh, build upon FI twenty four as well, or is there is any business which will be only restricted to FI twenty three uh, out of this one billion dollar? I think we. See, a lot of opportunities, not just in FA23, but FA24 as well. As we build capacities, uh, we are adding a lot of uh, customers, a lot of uh, approvals are expected. Um, I, I don't see um, there will be 
any one-off in FA23 for us to reach our target. Yeah. Okay, sir. Thanks. Thanks a lot for addressing this question. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Harit Ahmed from Spark Capital Advisors. Please go ahead. Good morning. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, my first question is on Loris Bio. So the 35 crores uh, revenue for the quarter, so very impressive uh, ramp up there. Trying to understand how much of the 180 kiloliter capacities uh, are being used now. So what is the utilization of, of the new capacity that's, that we, we've added uh, as of the fourth quarter? And then and, uh, slightly from a long-term perspective, uh, from, from biotech ingredients that we're making now, uh, and as we aspire to do, fermentation-based drugs and maybe therapeutic proteins in the future. Uh, the current uh, capacities that we have at Loris Bio, uh, will those capacities, uh, can, can we use those capacities for uh, these uh, you know, future products that uh, we would be, uh, you know, we would be manufacturing at Loris Bio and, and, uh, and how long will that journey be as we transition from the current uh, set of products which are largely enzymes to drugs and, and therapeutic proteins? Uh, I'll answer the question in maybe three uh, parts. One is uh, our 180,000 liter capacity is fully operational in Q4. And we are taking up some deep bottlenecking exercise to add more downstream capacity so that we can utilize our fermenters much better than what we're doing today. So uh, new capacity Fermentation capacity will only come by end of 2024, um, FI24. So significant growth in revenues at Bio can come only in 25. Despite uh, maybe probably some growth will come because of the deep water leaking of R1 and R2. That is one. And second, uh, in the current plan, the medium term until 2025, FI25, we have no plans to go into therapeutic proteins. So most of our capacity utilization currently and until FI25 will be only in the uh, food proteins, recombinant food proteins. So we are still having a strategy, internal discussions, uh, when and how we will enter into therapeutic proteins. Okay, okay. And then the same fermenters, including the uh, 1 million uh, capacity that we are adding, can the same fermenters be used for? Uh, you know, drugs like statins or therapeutic proteins when we uh, enter those businesses? Or those are totally different types of reactors that's needed for those kind of products? The 1 million liter large fermentation capacity what we're creating is for CMO of food proteins. Okay. The fermenters for um, uh, other pharmaceutical intermediates is under discussion with our bio team at Bangalore, and that capacity has to be created separately to this food protein capacity. Thanks, sir. That's helpful. Uh, understood that point. Uh, second question is on uh, the uh, CDMO uh, and, and, and segment, and, and we have uh, uh, talked about three new facilities which can potentially uh, start uh, supplies from FI 2425. So uh, how much of an increase uh, we are seeing in our uh, CDMO capacity? So, uh, you know, uh, what kind of an increase from the current capacities will happen uh, uh, for the CDMO business when, when these three new facilities uh, come on stream? Currently, the capacity is shared between the CDMO and generic API space. So we, as we are seeing a lot of uh, opportunities, we are creating dedicated capacities for CDMO. The reactor volume, what we are creating for CDMO, will be close to, uh, to start with 500 cubic meter, and uh, maybe 600 cubic meters, right? And then we, we have the ability to add more capacity brownfield because the land parcel, what we are using for these uh, uh, new greenfield facilities is uh, big. Okay, okay. So the current 7,000 kiloliter capacity that that uh, we're talking about is is uh, overlapping between uh, APIs and CDMO. That's the way to think about it. Yes, you're right. The 700 uh, 7,000 cubic meter capacity is shared between the divisions, and whatever new capacity Greenfield will create, we are creating 
is exclusive to the um, uh, CDMO division. Okay, okay. And then last one, with your permission, uh, we, we, when I look at the balance sheet, there's a sharp increase in other current liabilities uh, and, and uh, uh, trying to understand what has led to this and, and you know, our operating cash flows uh, appear to have benefited from this. Uh, so is there something uh, that you can call out here? I think the other current liabilities because of the higher purchases in the quarter four. So we, we need to uh, gear, uh, gear up for the higher revenues in the FA23. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll maybe take it offline. Uh, that's all for my yeah. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Before we take the next question, a reminder to the participants, please limit your questions to two per participant. For any follow-up, may be requested to rejoin the queue. The next question is from the line of Tarang from Old Bridge Capital. Please go ahead. Hello, sir. Good afternoon. Uh, just a couple of questions from me. One, um, uh, so the $1 billion uh, target uh, in the current financial year, uh, what is uh, driving the confidence uh, for this? I mean, are there some uh, uh, products that are maybe uh, approaching expiry or some one-off opportunities in the U.S.? That's number one. And number two, um, uh, just a book quick bookkeeping question on uh, contract manufacturing revenues in the formulations business and how much was ARV as a percentage of total business for FI22? As you've seen in FI22, our ARV APA business is 25% and uh, synthesis business is close to 20%. In FI23, we expect uh, the all divisions will grow, but the percentages broadly will remain similar. What it means, that means we have opportunities to grow APA business back to healthy growth. Formulations uh, in U.S., we have a few big launches uh, ahead of us. And uh, we are expecting approvals for two products in Europe where our partner, we already signed a big contract manufacturing. So the growth is evenly spread between APIs, uh, formulations, and uh, CDM. And bio will also grow, but uh, that is not going to be a significant portion of the overall revenue base. Okay, and how much do you say ARV formulations plus API as a percentage of FI22 revenues? ARV APIs and formulations are uh, close to 55% uh, of our revenues came from uh, ARVs. Thank you. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Krish Mehta from Inam Holdings. Please go ahead. Hi, thank you for taking my questions. So the first one was just a clarification on the previous question on the ARV versus non-ARV business. The 55% share of ARV business is the total ARV share in the entire revenue stream, or is it just for API, FDF? APIs, ARV APIs contributed only 25% in FI22. See, if in FI16, um, the year before we went to public, the ERV APIs contributed 82% of revenue, and it was down to 25%. The, the ERV revenues in FI, API revenues in FI 16 were uh, 1,450 crores. In FI 22, ERV API revenues were 1,250 crores. So while we remain the almost constant on the uh, revenue terms, but the percentage terms went down from 82 to 25. That is the kind of diversification the company went through the last six years. Whereas our revenues from formulations were zero in FI16, but in FI22 we had 38% revenue coming from formulations. So our formulation revenues in um, uh, FI16 were 20 crores, and uh, we did almost uh, uh, almost 1,800 crores in uh, FI22. Uh, CDMO revenues were of about 100 crores, and we went up to 917 crores in FI22. That's the kind of diversification what we were talking earlier, and we'll continue to put efforts to diversify the business further by FI25. As we mentioned by FI25, uh, our ARV sales, both the APS and formulas put together, should be maybe one-third of our revenues. Yeah. 
not 55 as in FA22. Okay, thank you. And my next question was on the synthesis business. So given the billion dollar target and your uh, previous statement on, uh, you see the mix remaining uh, broadly similar. So do you see the change in margins with the billion dollar target coming through like a CDMO business or would you uh, guide your margins towards being similar to what we've seen in the last uh, two, three years? I think we will be very similar. We don't want to give more precise details, but it will be very similar. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Pratik Gupta from Guardian AMC. Please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, thank you and uh, congratulations sir, for the numbers. I just wanted to know how are we seeing on the forecasting proportion mix for API in the next uh, coming year? Towards API and other, uh, ARV and other uh, onco and stuff. Our onco APIs, um, yeah. when our revenue base was small, it used to be about 8%. Now, yeah. also it is about 6% of revenues in FI22 despite the big base. Mm -hmm. A non ARV, non ANCO uh, were very low in FA16. About 4% of revenues came from non ARV, non ANCO. That went up to 10% in FA22. So that also shows our diversification. We have uh, um, validated about 10 AP, 12 DMFs filed, filed in FA22. That was the highest in our history. And majority, not majority, all of those were, except one, all of those were uh, non-ARVs. So we see opportunities for us to do more non-ARV, non-ANCO revenues from FI24 onwards. So we believe we have reached significant optimum level in both the APIs and formulations in ARVs. Uh, and our growth predominant will come from non-ARVs, both in APIs as well as in the formulation space. So it's fair to say that it will be equally proportion in the coming quarters? Oh, yeah. So I, I couldn't get your question, sir. Can you repeat? No, is it fair to say that the uh, proportion will be almost uh, equally or, uh, I mean, focus will be more towards the non onco and non ARV? Yes. Uh, in the coming quarters and years, uh, we expect the revenue contribution as a percentage wise will come down from ARVs uh, while we maintain the same quantum of business, both in APS and formulations for ARVs. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And my second question is, uh, in the presentation, I saw that we, we are trying to maintain a leadership pipeline in the API segment. So what could be the market share as a whole in US, Europe, as such? It's a, maybe we can take this question offline, but you can, so we can't give you the specific product sure, share sure. in the uh, US. So, yeah. We haven't lost any market share, and we haven't seen any pricing pressure in our uh, products what we are selling in Europe and US. Okay. Yeah. And the third, uh, a small question, sir, and add on that. Uh, we are seeing a revenue growth to be seasonal in the Q4 or FI on, on for like for three years. So do we say that the business is seasonality or is it uh, just because the growth of synthesis is higher in this quarter? Uh, typically, for the last several years, our Q4 synthesis revenues were higher because of the bulky shipments happened in the Q4 to suit the production yeah. demand of our partners. Um, but there's no significant other than that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that's it from my side. Thank you. And congratulations for having Thank you. The next question is from the line of Jeevan Patwa from Sahastra's PMS. Please go ahead. Congratulations, sir. This is a wonderful set of numbers. Uh, I just want to understand, like, earlier we were saying that we have $1 billion aspirational target, and then we uh, receive a large order from Global Life Sciences Company, and then we, then basically in one of your interviews said, $1 billion is not an aspirational target anymore, we will achieve it. So, uh, just want to understand, was this order earlier uh, the part of your aspirational target, or this order has come over and above the target that we were, uh, we were basically thinking of. See, this relationship with the new partner is already there. We got the additional orders from the partner. It's not that we have added a new customer just uh, during the last financial year. And uh, see, 
we were talking about this aspiration number almost a year back, or uh, maybe two years back actually, not even a year. Uh, so but this this is the goal we kept, and we are adding products, we are adding capacity. Ultimately, we need two things to achieve any targets. One is, do we have capacity? The answer is yes. Do we have products? The answer is yes. Do we have the market? I, I think yes. Because of these three uh, things, and we are prepared well, so now we are confident to reach our target. Okay. Okay. And secondly, the CDMO quarter, so this quarter of CDMO sales has been very, very good. And I think this included only one month of supply for the new order. So, uh, looks like next year can be really uh, pretty, pretty big impact for CDMO. So, how much you are expecting to close FY23 with for CDMO? Is it like... Uh, Unfortunately, I, I, we can't give you more details, but uh, we can assure you that uh, our focus and commitment, conviction on the CDMO business is giving results. And we can't, that's the reason we have created a separate entity, we are creating separate facilities for the division because of the um, some long-term contracts that we have signed, some opportunities in front of us. So this division uh, is what watching for, for everyone, including us. So we are investing because of opportunities ahead of us. Perfect. The last question, sir. Is, is there any update on the Immuno Act? They started, I think, the human trials uh, some six months back. So any timelines when uh, the results will be out or something? We expect some um, results read out uh, during this financial year. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thanks a lot, sir. That's Thanks. it. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Rahul Veera from Abacus. Please go ahead. Hi, sir. Uh, congratulations for the uh, large order from the Global Science License Company. I uh, just wanted to understand directionally, like how potent, what is the potential from this particular molecule? You know, it can, it could be a one-off, right? Like uh, in the start of the call, you mentioned that after a billion dollars, it's not going to be any one-off in the one billion dollar in FY23. So it seems like like something like a package it could be a one-off. And what would be the potential for this molecule in this year itself? See, uh, just I want to reiterate, I mean, our aspirational target, there is no one-off revenues considered. Uh, just I want to reiterate. And, uh, yeah. Okay. We can't give you any specific details about the product quantities right now. Um, because of the confidentiality issues, we can't give you more details. But also, potentially, like if I see, like uh, Pfizer has eventually mentioned that they're going to do $22 billion of sales by this molecule. And even if you consider, uh, like, your voice is not Sorry to interrupt, but your voice is not uh, good, sir. If you can uh, speak closer. Sure, sure. Yeah. Sure. Sir, I was just uh, thinking that Pfizer has mentioned that in its uh, presentation that they're going to do $22 billion of Pexclovid sales in CY22. And if you consider 3 to 4% of our total opportunity size for us, it's pretty sizable for us. So can you throw some direction in there? Like, is it a $100 million plus opportunity for us or it's much bigger? So, um, so, uh, unfortunately, we can't give any details on our contract, product, or pricing. And the quantum of the order also. See, we, we gave what we can give and what we are supposed to give. Okay, okay. Fair point, sir. Fair point, sir. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. The next question is from the line of Hossein Kagzi from Ambit Asset Management. Please go ahead. Hello. Hi. Uh, good morning. Am I audible? Uh, yes, sir, you are. Please proceed. Yeah. So, uh, my first question was with regards to CAPEX. So, I wanted to understand that uh, with the uh, huge uh, cost inflation going on right now, so are we seeing that our cost of CAPEX, what we had guided for, is uh, are we seeing any inflation on that side? So, that was my first question. See, in, if you look at uh, our several quarter uh, investor accounts, the one where uh, we are increasing is our CAPEX number. So, we were... Uh, um, giving lower guidance and increasing it because of the opportunities. See, in, in the last year, we were saying um, for two years, our revenue, our CapEx will be between 1,500 to 1,700 crores. And, uh, and now, 
for next two years, we say it is between 2,000 to 2,005 crores. That is the kind of capex is there in front of us. That's for next one, FI23 and FI24. Uh, we may spend anywhere between 2,000 to 2,005 crores capex. Okay, okay, understood, understood. And uh, sir, on CDMO side, just uh, wanted, uh, or, or the custom census side, just wanted one clarification is that uh, as far as my limited understanding goes, uh, the innovator contracts, so our revenue is dependent on how the molecule progresses from one stage to the other and on the success of the molecule at the innovator's end. So referring to the large contract that we signed, uh, that we announced at the end of Q2. So how is that structured? As in, does it include a manufacturing uh, component as well for which we'll be supplying or has the molecule already been commercialized? This is with regards to what we announced in Q2. The molecule is commercialized and we are, we, we are supplying, so there is no uncertainty in that. Uh, okay, okay. All right. Got it. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Ritesh Rathod from Nippon India Mutual Fund. Please go ahead. Yeah. Hi, sir. Uh, this CDMO contract, uh, would we start contributing from 1Q FY23 in a normalized way or it would slowly ramp up over FY23? It's already supply started and uh, we supply as for the partner demand. We can't give you any more details on that. But it, it would be, it, it would, won't be like initial stage, it would be very low and then eventually second or third stage you will supply the full quantity. It would be evenly spread out, right? It will be spread out, yeah. Okay, okay. And on the CapEx side, have you uh, increased the guidance uh, from what you were talking of last quarter? Like... Yes, we have increased our CapEx guidance by almost about five, six hundred crores than what we were saying earlier because of uh, the opportunities what we are seeing and we want to ready to ready with capacities to take on those opportunities. Okay. Thanks. That's from my side. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Naresh Sutar from SBI Life Insurance. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Uh, thank you for taking my question. Uh, my question is again on margins. <coughs> uh, if I look at the gross margins, uh, uh, will this base, uh, will this, this be the new base for uh, 523 in, uh, going forward? Uh, for quarter four margins, I'm referring to. Qu quarter four margins were down when compared to the previous quarter of the corresponding quarter for multiple reasons. One is the challenges in uh, solvent pricing, raw material pricing, logistics cost. Uh, product mix changes, uh, energy and uh, fuel cost, all those uh, contributed to lower uh, gross margins there. So this will, I mean, like you said, ERV, uh, the price pressure, which is a new base, even solid prices, I don't know whether it is uh, uh, coming down. So uh, that way, uh, this should be the new base for our gross margin. It's what my question. See, the ARV API sale and formulation sale ARVs will remain, we expect little growth, but mostly flattish. So, as we increase our revenues from non ARV, both APS and formulations, we expect these gross margins to slightly go up from the current base. Yeah. Okay. One more question. Uh, uh, can I say quarter to quarter, uh, uh, the CSM business, the CDMO business, the margins were uh, uh, similar to quarter three in not uh, asking for uh, actual numbers, but uh, uh, rationally, was the margin in that segment uh, same versus last quarter, quarter three? We can't give it segment-wise uh, grass margins, but as I mentioned, uh, from... 52% uh, gross margin in FI uh, quarter 4, we, we, we'll put efforts to increase it further, uh, but we can't give you more details beyond that. Uh, so it will go up. We don't expect margins to go down. I appreciate that. Why? Uh, my, uh, I mean, I asked this question because uh, I just wanted to understand uh, whether uh, the, uh, the raw material pressure was seen in KDM or business as well. That's what the question. No, no. 
Thank you. The next question is from the line of Tushar Bora from MK Ventures. Please go ahead. Yeah, uh, thanks for the opportunity and uh, congratulations to the management uh, for a much improved set of numbers. First, uh, so quick clarification first up. Uh, so our aspiration is for, uh, you know, in addition to the revenue aspiration, is the margin aspiration closer to 30%? Uh, is that was mentioned earlier in the call for FI23? We, we, we remain confident to achieve that kind of margins, yeah. Okay. Uh, second, uh, sir, the solvent pricing, uh, have we been able to take on some price hikes to compensate or has the pricing started to stabilize or even uh, moderate a bit? Uh, any color on the overall you know, fact, raw material pricing as a whole for this uh, quarter and the coming trend? We, we expect the prices, solvent prices and raw material prices will soften further. Uh, but currently, the Weaker gas margin, what we report in Q4 is because of several factors, including solvent prices and raw material prices. And we expect that will soften further, and we will improve our margins from the 50 to percent higher. Yeah. Uh, so you also mentioned specifically uh, energy cost and uh, logistics cost. Uh, any color on, on uh, incrementally on those lines? And also, if anything, on the disruption... So I'm emanating from China, if you can share your views on that. The energy cost only transient. We don't expect that cost to be there for several quarters. So we, we may see that challenge for only Q1. Uh, then onwards, we don't see any energy cost escalation. Uh, and the other fact is, freight costs are higher for not just pharma business, for any other business as, as well. And uh, we have no visibility on how and when the, uh, the logistics will be improved. Yeah. Okay. But it would be fair to say, sir, that uh, specifically en energy costs would have impacted maybe by uh, at least uh, 100 bips, maybe slightly more on the margin front? We can't quantify this, sir. Okay. See, sir, uh, uh, what Dr. Uh, Satya is talking about is a quarter one um, of the FI23 on the energy cost. Except with the Coal cost increase, which got impacted last year. Okay, sure. But the energy cost is not going into our gas margin. I mean, below that. So our gas margin is raw metal, same price as raw metal cost. So our energy cost will impact our EBITDA, but not our gas margin. Yeah. Right. Uh, so actually, sir, uh, it, uh, the overall gross margin, if you see, uh, year on year, the gross margin has actually been flattish only, but our overall EBITDA margins have come down. So certainly these line items have got impacted, right? See, our, because of the scale effect, see, operational deal leverage, yeah. uh, uh, if you look at what happened, our revenue numbers are similar numbers of last year. But you have an escalation of the costs. Those costs then need, have to be absorbed into the EBITDA. That is the reason you will find the difference on a yearly basis, Tushar. Sure, sure, sir. Second, uh, on the uh, strategy side, uh, so one, uh, if we could share more color on the sterile R&D, and also uh, when we had done this minority ac uh, acquisition in the uh, Immuno Act, uh, you know, startup, uh, at that time we had uh, mentioned this as being only an, uh, you know, sort of an investment, but uh, our, uh, our commentary in this on call has been that uh, this is a significant foray for us. So is there a plan to consolidate the stakes further in uh, Immuno Act or, or maybe develop this line of business further? Uh, I'll answer our um, first question uh, in the sterile R&D space. So we wanted to, in the sterile space, so we, you know, ours is R&D first approach. So we're putting up R&D center for our sterile um, and then we have land to set up a manufacturing facility for uh, sterile man, uh, products. Coming back to Immuno Act, we, this is an investment, and we have no plans to consolidate. And uh, um, certain part of our profits we wanted to invest in technologies where we don't have expertise um, like this, and we continue to identify such opportunities. Uh, but that's not our core strength. So, you know, we, we, our core strength is manufacturing, and immunoactive core strength is drug discovery, and uh, um, so they will do. They 
chairperson and we have no ideas to consolidate them or invest in similar lines. So, it would be fair uh, to... Mr. Bora, uh, so I sorry to interrupt, it. but for any follow-up, may we request you to rejoin the queue, please. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Dipen Sheth from UN Capital. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity. Sir, I want to, uh, you know, kind of raise this question about gross margin change over 3Q to 4Q uh, in an effort to understand uh, how much of that happened because of business mix change, how much of that was happening uh, because of price erosion, and how much of that uh, ha happened because of maybe a, a pull up from the, the higher mix of the synthesis business in the fourth quarter because I think the outstanding feature of the fourth quarter is that you've delivered more than 150 crores incremental quarterly revenues on the synthesis business. Now, normally I would expect that that's a very high gross margin business. I don't know the specifics of your business. Uh, but but with this kind of a boost, if, if sequentially gross margins fell from 59 or 58.8 to 52%, uh, despite a huge boost from the synthesis business, there's something about the relative movement of, you know, margins across the four segments that we are missing here. So I, I think Naresh did ask this question, but I, I'm not sure whether I could understand your response. How would you interpret this for us, that synthesis goes up by, you know, from 207 to 360 crores sequentially, and uh, there is a reasonably higher contribution from APIs as well, uh, another 100 crores in incremental contribution. So was it that margins fell sharply in the API segment, the gross margins again? So how, how do you reconcile this for us? In the generic, you have to consider both APIs, the ARV APIs and the ARV formulations. Right. Both we have been to a new base. So there's the price reduction in both APS and formulations happened. In non-ARVs, we haven't seen pricing pressure. Okay. As we increase our non-ARV revenues, um, not just synthesis, but also non-ARV APIs, non-ARV formulation sales goes up, so our margins level will improve further. So we were at a new base in ARVs, and, uh, but the ARV price reduction is the major contributor to drop in gross margins. Uh, and then solvent prices. Uh, right. These are the two major reasons for drop in gas margins. And and um, would it not be fair on my part to expect a pull up, uh, countervailing effect, uh, as it were, from the synthesis business ramp up? Is that a fair assumption to make that synthesis is a is a very good gross margin business and should have pulled up a little bit the overall gross margins in the quarter? As, as we mentioned, uh, the margins will move up because the revenue contribution from non ARV business will go up. That is the reason we expect the 52 percent. Uh, from 52 percent, we expect improvement. We can't give you how much will improve, but there will be improvement possible. All right, sir. Understood. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Surjit Pal from BOB Capital Markets. Please go ahead. Uh, <coughs> Thank you for the opportunity. Um, I have just one question about that CDMO uh, business where you have started uh, supplying product which has been commercialized as uh, stated in the presentation. Uh, if you throw some light about your client's product in, in terms of therapeutic area, the market where it has been launched, and how much sales we could expect uh, in, say, next two to three years, and how many suppliers will be there along with you, initial, uh, you know, two to three years? See, unfortunately, we can't give you any more details on that. Uh, pricing or product or quantities, we can't give you because of the confidentiality. See, that, that is the one uh, reason why people like us, we maintain confidentiality with our partners' products. So, generic, we have given enough details because we are able to give. In the CDMO, we can't give you any details. It is not our product, it is their product. So we are bound to confidential agreement. We, we are giving grass margins, uh, price reductions, all possible um, facts in our generic business. We can't give you in our CDMO business. Yeah, I'm not asking uh, you tell the name of the product or the company or the, the things, but I need to understand, you know, or we need to understand is that uh, you know, the kind of therapeutic area or uh, the kind of uh, 
you know, n number of people who are supplying this API currently to him, you know, uh, that we don't know how many softwares are there. We don't know. Generally, generally, two to uh, three suppliers will be there initial three years post launch. Right. If it is a big we don't product, uh, yeah. we don't know. Yeah. We don't know. Thank you. Thank you. Next question is from the line of Ranveer Singh from Sunidhi Securities. Please go ahead. Yeah, uh, thanks for the opportunity and uh, congrats for a good set of numbers. Uh, just on uh, revenue aspiration, one billion. Just I wanted to understand, uh, you know, in better perspective. So the growth uh, in FY23 we are talking about is uh, more than over 50 percent. Uh, on Y on Y, so uh, that that would be uh, built on mostly on synthesis business API or formulation. Can you give some indication? See, one thing all of us need to understand: Did this company ever achieved 50 percent growth in revenues earlier? We have done that a couple of times. So even if you look at FI 20 to 21, we have grown more than 50 percent. And in FI, um, actually we have grown uh, in FI 20, FI 12, FI 13, FI 14, our growth is more than 50%. That means we have the ability to create a base and then grow significantly. And uh, if you believe that we have delivered multiple times earlier, and we will also deliver this time because of our capacity, what we have created, because of the products what we have, because of the order book what we have, uh, we will achieve those. So, you are right, we have to grow more than 50 percent to achieve our target of a billion. And we are fairly confident on achieving that. So it is more towards formulation business? or, or it's on. All segments will grow. All the formulation will grow. API, except the ARV APIs and some formulations, all the rest of the divisions will have significant growth. Okay. So for FY24, can we uh, see a growth over FY23? <laughs> we can't comment right now. So maybe we can ask this question in Q4 FA23. We'll be able to give you some answer. <laughs> okay. okay. And, and uh, just uh, on formulation side, what is our uh, level of integration? How much uh, business is integrated with our own API? Uh, except one and a where you are fine with by using third-party API. All other vendors commercialized not on the development of base load of Inos API. In fact, the one which we use, third party API, we don't have any market share. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And I see in uh, balance sheet. Uh, yeah. I'm so sorry yeah. to interrupt, but for any follow up, maybe request to rejoin the queue, please. Oh, sure, sure, sure. Thank Thanks. You. The next question is from the line of Alisha Mahawala from Envision Capital. Please go ahead. Hi, sir. Good afternoon, and thank you for taking my question. Um, just uh, with respect to what the earlier participant was asking, with respect to a $1 billion revenue target. Um, so um, I, I do believe that we're expecting the two formulations that were uh, to be launched in Europe to contribute. Is it possible to say, are we expecting that in H2, or will we start seeing some of that contribution from H1? And what is the opportunity size that we're targeting? I, I can't give the size of opportunity, but those products will be commercially launched in uh, Q3. In Q3. Yeah. Okay. So, and apart from that, um, on the CDMO side also, um, apart from the one contract that that did start some marginal contribution in Q4, the other one for which we're doing the fast track capex, is that also expected to start uh, contributing from 23? The capacity what we are adding currently is also about 15 percent of APA capacity we're adding, but that will not contribute to revenue in FA23. So this, see, we have to grow in FA24 as well, for which we need to create capacity. See, unless we create capacity, how the pharma company will grow? Either we have to do acquisitions um, or create capacity. You know, uh, most of our uh, growth is coming organically by creating capacities in-house. So we are putting capacities for our future growth. I'm referring to the multi-year contract that was signed in Q2. Oh. Um, sorry, that, that we are creating capacity, a greenfield new site being created, 
that will be qualified mid of next year that is uh, sometime q2 q3 next year uh, will go commercial yeah so we are saying mid of 24 yes so mid, only, mid, yeah, sorry we mean mid of calendar year 23 that's what i mean yeah okay understood and um, on the on co api side so on or rather on the non arv api side do we have significant do we have capacity to continue to um, grow in that space also yes we have capacities we are creating more capacities in ipotent but that will come towards the end of 23 the new capacity in api yes yes Okay, so maybe you can just tell me what is the current utilization level in the API um, segment? Full. Uh, actually, we are we are running optimum capacity. Okay, uh, so maybe on the non-ARV side, the growth will come towards the end of the year once new capacity comes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, mm-hmm. ladies and gentlemen. Due to time constraint, that was the last question. I now hand the conference over to the management for their closing comments. Over to you, sir. thank you all of you for uh, giving uh, outside in view what we are doing and these questions will certainly improve our uh, thinking and our uh, strategy to create long term stakeholder value for everyone thank you thank you thank you uh, ladies and gentlemen on behalf of antix stock broking that concludes this conference we thank you all for joining us and you may now disconnect your lines